This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Annie Coleman in St. Louis, Missouri, in February 2006. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Chapter 12. It must have been a close on to one o'clock when we got below the island at last, and the raft did seem to go mighty slow. If a boat was to come along, we was going to take to the canoe and break for the Illinois shore, and it was well a boat didn't come, for we had never thought to put the gun in the canoe, or a fishing line, or anything to eat. We was in brother too much of a sweat to think of so many things. It warn't good judgment to put everything on the raft. If the men went to the island, I just expect they found the campfire I built, and watched it all night for Jim to come. Anyways, they stayed away from us, and if my building the fire never fooled them, it warn't no fault of mine. I played it as low down on them as I could. When the first streak of day began to show, we tied up to a towhead in a big bend on the Illinois side, and hacked off cottonwood branches with the hatchet, and covered up the raft with them, so she looked like there had been a cave-in in the bank there. A towhead is a sandbar that has cottonwoods on it as thick as harrow teeth. We had mountains on the Missouri shore, and heavy timber on the Illinois side, and the channel was down the Missouri shore at that place, so we weren't afraid of anybody running across us. We laid there all day and watched the rafts and steamboats spin down the Missouri shore, and upbound steamboats fight the big river in the middle. I told Jim all about the time I had jabbering with that woman, and Jim said she was a smart one, and if she was to start after us herself, she wouldn't sit down and watch a campfire. No, sir, she'd fetch a dog. Well, then, I said, why couldn't she tell her husband to fetch a dog? Jim said he bet she did think of it by the time the men was ready to start, and he believed they must have gone up town to get a dog, and so they lost all that time, or else we wouldn't be here on a towhead, sixteen or seventeen mile below the village. No, indeedy, we would be in that same old town again. So I said I didn't care what the reason was, they didn't get us, as long as they didn't get us. When it was beginning to come on dark, we poked our heads out of the cottonwood thicket, and looked up and down and across, nothing in sight. So Jim took up some of the top planks of the raft, and built a snug wigwam to get under in blazing weather and rainy, and to keep the things dry. Jim made a floor for the wigwam, and raised it a foot or more above the level of the raft, so now the blankets and all the traps was out of reach of steamboat waves. Right in the middle of the wigwam, we made a layer of dirt about five or six inches deep with a frame around it, for to hold it to its place. This was to build a fire on in sloppy weather or chilly. The wigwam would keep it from being seen. We made an extra steering oar, too, because one of the others might get broke on a snag or something. We fixed up a short forked stick to keep the old lantern on, because we must always light the lantern whenever we see a steamboat coming downstream to keep from getting run over but we wouldn't have to light it for upstream boats, unless we was in what they call a crossing, for the river was pretty high yet, very low banks being still a little under water, so upbound boats didn't always run the channel, but hunted easy water. The second night we run between seven and eight hours, with a current that was making over four mile an hour. We catched fish and talked, and we took a swim now and then to keep off sleepiness. It was kind of solemn, drifting down the big still river, laying on our backs looking up at the stars, and we didn't never feel like talking loud, and it weren't often that we laughed, only a little kind of a low chuckle. We had mighty good weather as a general thing, and nothing ever happened to us at all, that night, nor the next, nor the next. Every night we passed towns, some of them away up on black hillsides, nothing but just a shiny bed of lights, not a house could you see. The fifth night we passed St. Louis, and it was like the whole world lit up. In St. Petersburg, they used to say there was twenty or thirty thousand people in St. Louis, but I never believed it, till I see that wonderful spread of lights at two o'clock that still night. There weren't a sound there, everybody was asleep. Every night now I used to slip ashore towards ten o'clock at some little village, and buy ten or fifteen cents worth of meal or bacon or other stuff to eat, and sometimes I lifted a chicken that weren't roosting comfortable, and took him along. Pap always said, take a chicken when you get a chance, because if you don't want em yourself, you can easy find somebody that does, and a good deed ain't ever forgot. 
I never see Pap when he didn't want the chicken himself, but that is what he used to say anyway. Mornings before daylight, I slipped into cornfields and borrowed a watermelon or a mush melon or a pumpkin or some new corn or things of that kind. Pap always said it warn't no harm to borrow things if you was meanin' to pay them back some time, but the widow said it warn't anything but a soft name for stealin', and no decent body would do it. Jim said he reckoned the widow was partly right and Pap was partly right. So the best way would be for us to pick out two or three things from the list and say we wouldn't borrow them any more. Then he reckoned it wouldn't be no harm to borrow the others. So we talked it over all one night, drifting along down the river, trying to make up our minds whether to drop the watermelons or the cantaloupes or the mush melons or what. But towards daylight we got it all settled satisfactory and concluded to drop crab apples and persimmons. We weren't feeling just right before that, but it was all comfortable now. I was glad the way it come out, too, because crab apples ain't never good, and the persimmons wouldn't be ripe for two or three months yet. We shot a waterfowl now and then, and got up too early in the morning, or didn't go to bed early enough in the evening. Take it all around, we lived pretty high. The fifth night below St. Louis, we had a big storm after midnight, with a power of thunder and lightning, and the rain poured down in a solid sheet. We stayed in the wigwam and let the raft take care of itself. When the lightning glared out, we could see a big straight river ahead, and high rocky bluffs on both sides. By and by, says I, Hello, Jim, look yonder. It was a steamboat that had killed herself on a rock. We was drifting straight down for her. The lightning showed her very distinct. She was leaning over with part of her upper deck above water, and you could see every little chimbley guy, clean and clear. And a chair by the big bell with an old slouch hat hanging on the back of it when the flashes come. Well, it being away in the night and stormy and all so mysterious like, I felt just the way any other boy would have felt when I see that wreck laying there so mournful and lonesome in the middle of the river. I wanted to get aboard of her and slink around a little and see what there was there. So I says, Let's land on her, Jim. But Jim was dead against it at first. He says, I don't want to go foolin' long or no rack. We's doin' blame well, and we better let blame well alone, as the good book says. Like as not, dey's a watchman on dat rack. Watchman, your grandmother, I says. There ain't nothin' to watch but the Texas and the pilot house. And do you reckon anybody's goin' to risk his life for a Texas and a pilot house such a night as this, when it's likely to break up and wash off down the river any minute? Jim couldn't say nothin' to that, so he didn't try. And besides, I says, we might borrow something worth having out of the captain's stateroom. Cigars, I bet you, and cost five cents apiece, solid cash. Steamboat captains is always rich and get sixty dollars a month, and they don't care a cent of what a thing costs, you know, long as they want it. Stick a candle in your pocket. I can't rest, Jim, till we give her a rummage in. Do you reckon Tom Sawyer would ever go buy this thing? Not for pie, he wouldn't. He'd call it an adventure. That's what he'd call it, and he'd land on that wreck if it was his last act. And wouldn't he throw style into it? Wouldn't he spread himself nor nothing? Why, you'd think it was Christopher Columbus discovering kingdom come. I wish Tom Sawyer was here. Jim, he grumbled a little, but give in. He said we mustn't talk any more than we could help, and then talk mighty low. The lightning showed us the wreck again just in time. And we fetched the starboard derrick and made fast there. The deck was high out here. We went sneaking down the slope of it to the labboard in the dark towards the Texas, feeling our way slow with our feet and spreading our hands out to fend off the guys, for it was so dark we couldn't see no sign of them. Pretty soon we struck the forward end of the skylight and clumb on to it, and the next step fetched us in front of the captain's door, which was open, and by Jiminy, away down through the Texas hall we see a light. And all in the same second, we seemed to hear low voices in yonder. Jim whispered and said he was feeling powerful sick and told me to come along. I says all right and was going to start for the raft, but just then I heard a voice wail out and say, Oh, please don't, boys. I swear I won't ever tell. Another voice said pretty loud, It's a lie, Jim Turner. You've acted this way before. You always want more than your share of the truck. And you've always got it too, because you've swore if you didn't, you'd tell. But this time you've said it just one time too many. 
You're the meanest, treacherousest hound in this country. By this time Jim was gone for the raft. I was just a bilin' with curiosity, and I says to myself, Tom Sawyer wouldn't back out now, and so I won't either. I'm a-goin' to see what's goin' on here. So I dropped on my hands and knees in the little passage, and crept aft in the dark till there weren't but one stateroom betwixt me and the cross hall of the Texas. Then in there I see a man stretched on the floor, and tied hand and foot, and two men standin' over him, and one of them had a dim lantern in his hand, and the other one had a pistol. This one kept pointin' the pistol at the man's head on the floor, and sayin', I'd like to, and I order to, a mean skunk. The man on the floor would shrivel up and say, Oh, please don't, Bill, I ain't ever goin' to tell. And every time he said that, the man with the lantern would laugh and say, Deed you ain't. You never said no truer thing in that, you bet you. And once he said, Hear him beg. And yet, if we hadn't got the best of him and tied him, he'd have killed us both. And what for? Just for nothing. Just because we stood on our rights. That's what for. But I lay you ain't a-goin' to threaten nobody any more, Jim Turner. Put up that pistol, Bill. Bill says, I don't want to, Jake Packard. I'm for killin' him. And didn't he kill old Hatfield just the same way? And don't he deserve it? But I don't want him killed, and I've got my reasons for it. Bless your heart for them words, Jake Packard. I'll never forget you long's I live, says the man on the floor, sort of blubberin'. Packard didn't take no notice of that, but hung up his lantern on a nail, and started towards where I was there in the dark, and motioned Bill to come. I crawfished as fast as I could about two yards, but the boat slanted so that I couldn't make very good time. So to keep from getting run over and catched, I crawled into a stateroom on the upper side. The man came a-pawin' along in the dark, and when Packer got to my stateroom, he says, Here, come in here. And in he come, and Bill after him. But before they got in, I was up in the upper berth, cornered, and sorry I come. Then they stood there with their hands on the ledge of the berth and talked. I couldn't see them, but I could tell where they was by the whiskey they'd been havin'. I was glad I didn't drink whiskey, but it wouldn't made much difference anyway, because most of the time they couldn't have treated me because I didn't breathe. I was too scared, and besides, a body couldn't breathe and hear such talk. They talked low and earnest. Bill wanted to kill Turner. He says, He said he'll tell, and he will. If we was to give both our shares to him now, it wouldn't make no difference after the row and the way we've served him. Sure's you're born, I'll turn state evidence. Now you hear me. I'm for putting him out of his troubles. So am I, says Packard, very quiet. Blame it, I'd sort of begun to think he wasn't. Well, then, that's all right. Let's go and do it. Hold on a minute, I hain't had my say yet. You listen to me. Shooting's good, but there's quieter ways if the thing has got to be done. But what I say is this. It ain't good sense to go courtin' around after a halter if you can get at what you're up to in some way that's just as good, and at the same time don't bring you into no risks. Ain't that so? You bet it is. But how you goin' to manage it this time? Well, my idea is this. We'll rustle around and gather up whatever pickings we've overlooked in the staterooms and shove for shore and hide the truck. Then we'll wait. Now, I say it ain't a goin' to be more'n two hours before this rack breaks up. "'and washes off down the river. "'See, he'll be drownded "'and won't have nobody to blame for it but his own self. "'I reckon that's a considerable sight better in killin' of him. "'I'm unfavorable to killin' a man "'as long as you can get around it. "'It ain't good sense. "'It ain't good morals. "'Ain't I right?' "'Yes, I reckon you are. "'But suppose she don't break up and wash off. "'Well, we can wait the two hours anyway and see, can't we? "'All right, then, come along.' So they started, and I lit out all in a cold sweat, and scrambled forward. It was dark as pitch there, but I said in a kind of a hoarse whisper, Jim! And he answered up right at my elbow with a sort of a moan. And I says, Quick, Jim, it ain't no time for fooling around and moaning. There's a gang of murderers in yonder, and if we don't hunt up their boat and send her drifting down the river so these fellows can't get away from the wreck, there's one of them going to be in a bad fix. But if we find their boat... We can put all of em in a bad fix, for the sheriff'll get em. Quick, hurry! I'll hunt the labbard side. 
"'You hunt the starboard. "'You start at the raft, and—' "'Oh, my lordy, lordy, raft! "'They ain't no raft no more. "'She done broke loose and gone, and here we is.' End of chapter 12